Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ron. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you've got a Bible or you've got the app, you might want to find Genesis chapter 26. Uh, and just while you're looking that up, I uh, want to talk about... Is this sounding all right? Is it, are, we, are we good? Yeah, good, great. Um, uh, uh, the reason why we're looking at this today, I just want to tell you a little story about the nursery. that we. So if you're a visitor, uh, and by the way, we haven't heard yet, okay? The offer's still on, and we haven't heard back from the, the agency yet. But, but I just want to tell you a little story about it. So... Because over the years, we've sought to look at how we extend this building, as, as most of you know. You know and we've looked seriously at extending out the back, and we've looked seriously at the opportunity of being able to use next door, and none of those have come to fruition. And for me personally, as we talked about those in the, in the leadership and everything, I always struggled with the fact I couldn't really feel, say hand on heart that I've heard God about this in some way. You know, and, and actually, I like to do that, right? For the big decisions in life, I think it's really important that we do what we can as followers of Jesus to try and hear God. And we do that in lots of ways, right? We talk to other people, see what they say. It's good to talk to people who disagree with you and hear what they say. That's a good thing to do. We pray about it and think, well, what do we think God's saying? Uh, but also we read the scriptures. We read the Bible and think, what does God say to us, you know, out of that? And, and that for me is often quite an important one and kind of get, how does the word speak to us today? And so as we, as we looked at the uh, the work out the back and the side. I, I can never really feel like I got there. But actually, when we started to look at the nursery, actually, I will be honest here. So this all started because Steve Bodie sent the leaders an email saying, the nursery's come for sale. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> we spent years pursuing two other options, hitting barriers and hurdles and things not working out. This is going to be another garden path we're going to walk down. And... Uh, uh, everybody else on the leadership chastised me, and rightly so. Uh, but, but, you know, I prayed about it uh, and, look, and, and spent time hearing God. And I felt God speak to me out of this passage that we're going to look at today. Um, and this isn't just about the nursery. This is about applying this passage to our lives today because I think that is something that is very important. So if you're new here, right, we're looking in the book of Genesis, which was the very first book of the Bible. So if you flick back to chapter 1, you see at the very beginning it tells the story of creation, of how God made everything. It tells the story of Adam and Eve and the thing in the garden with the apple and all that stuff, right? And how sin came into the world and how it got screwed up. Uh, it tells the story of Noah and the flood and how God wiped the earth out apart from one family and why he had to do that. It tells, then goes on and tells the story of this guy Abraham that when you read the chapter, it seems that God picks him randomly, but he chooses Abraham and calls him by name and sets him on a journey to go to the, what we call the promised land, the land that God will show him. And, and, and the Genesis story unfolds as the story of Abraham and Sarah, who are very old and don't have any children, and God promises to give them a child, and that through this child, all nations will be blessed, and through the, this child, Abraham will actually have so many descendants, you wouldn't be able to count them. They're more than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And so Abraham has this child called Isaac. Uh, and then there's a little test for Abraham about does he trust God more or does he trust his son more? Uh, and there's that story. And then Abraham dies. And so when we get to chapter 26, we're dealing now with his son, Isaac, uh, and what he is doing, and how that call of God that originally came to Abraham has now landed on his son, Isaac, and what Isaac is doing. And in chapter 26, there's a famine in the land where Isaac and his, and his, and his uh, herds and his family and his servants live. Uh, but God tells them to stay where they are. Actually, not move to another place with more food, but actually, in this instance, he tells them to stay put and that he will be with them. And we read that God blesses Isaac in that place so that he had so many flocks, herds, and servants. He did well for himself, you might say. And so I'm just going to read a few verses from chapter 26 of Genesis, verse, starting at verse 16. Then Abimelech, oh, okay. So in the land where they are, it's owned by the Philistines, and the leader of the Philistines is this guy, Abimelech. Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. 
But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Esek, which means dispute, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna, which means opposition. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, which means room, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Amen. So I called this talk, well, well, well. As you can see, Jeff gets it. Brilliant, right? Uh, But the well, right, in the story, the well is obviously, it's a place of refreshing, isn't it? It, it, It's vital in that climate and in that landscape for the people who live there, for their animals and for their livelihood. If there are no wells, because it's where they get the water, then it's bad news, isn't it? They get thirsty people and thirsty animals and maybe a lot worse. If there's plenty of wells, it's good news, right? You get healthy people and healthy animals. And in our passage today, Isaac has to leave where he is currently living. He has to pack down his tents. He has to let out the airbeds. He has to fold it all up into the trailer. He has to gather up all his children, all his cats, all his sheep and goats, and gather them all together, and then move them all off to the next land, trying to herd them all together, and move them all off somewhere else. And so as he moves... Uh, what we read about is that he digs wells where they move to because they need the water. But they get into a quarrel with the locals over the ownership of the well, and so they move on. And so they dig a second well where they move to, but then they quarrel again, and so they move on again. Finally, they dig a third well, and hey, presto, there's no quarreling. They can settle with this interesting statement he makes that the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. Now, I think there's just a few interesting things in this passage I want to tease out this morning, if I can. You know, first off, these are God's people, right? These are the people that God has chosen. So you would think God is with them. So you might even say, why did he even have a problem digging the first well? Surely if God is with them, it's all going to work out perfect, isn't it? No, right? Uh, and that's a good learning point for us as Christians as we follow Jesus, isn't it? That there's no divine right on us to expect everything to work hunky-dory from the word we go. Uh, so they have this challenge with these wells, but they press on. They persevere, and eventually they hit a well that not only provides water for them, but symbolizes the blessing of God in their lives. They have room they will flourish and they will be fruitful. And from there, at that point, Isaac encounters God in a dream and hears that amazing promise of God that first came to his dad about the promise of of his descendants and the hand of God on his life. And So what we see is here is pressure is applied to the people of God, right? They've got to move. Pressure is applied to the people of God, and so so they end up moving. Second thing we see is that perseverance is required. Things don't quite work out right to start off with, so they move on, and they have to persevere in moving and digging the wells. The third thing we see is that eventually, as they persevere, they land in the place of blessing. And the final thing is, having landed in the place of blessing, they significantly encounter the risen God, right? And those four things are principles that stick with God's people throughout the generations right down to you and me today. That pressure is applied to our life as we follow God because he wants us to move on, not necessarily geographically, right? But he wants us to deal with the things in our lives that that need dealing with and address them. And pressure is applied by him to bring that about. Second, we need to persevere as we run the race, don't we? Good. Some of us need to persevere. Great. So we need to persevere as we run the race. You know, it's a marathon. It's not a 100-yard dash. Uh, And we need to persevere and press on. But as we persevere and press on, God will bring us to a place of blessing. That's his heart's desire. And sometimes we lose sight of that, right? But, But that is heart's desire, is to bring you and I, as we follow Jesus, into a place of blessing. And in that place, we will encounter him, his power, his love, and his freedom. We'll tell you about that in a minute.
So what has this got to say to, say to us today? I've got two, two things. Just to come back to the nursery bit, right? So um, I think uh, there's an element of risk of me saying this, right? But, but this passage spoke to me because I just identified those two wells was like extending the building or moving next door. As I read this passage, right? This is a personal thing, right? I'm not saying this is what you've all got to think and believe, right? This is how I, I read the passage and I felt God speak to me. But the, those two wells are like what we've done before. And this nursery is like the third well. And so my prayer is that God will give us room, right? And we will flourish in the land. And that God through us will be fruitful through that. And, and, so, and so that's how it spoke, it spoke to me. And so that is, that's my prayer at the moment, and we will have to wait and see, right? But, but we clearly don't rely on wells today in our climate, he says, looking out the window at the rain, <laughs> the drizzle, right? We don't need that, right? We all have tapped, piped water into our homes, uh, and we don't need it. So what is the relevance of this story, of this passage written thousands and thousands of years ago to us today? Like so much of the Old Testament, we kind of need to look a little bit at Jesus in the New Testament and apply that backwards. So it would, what did Jesus have to say about water? So in John chapter 4, we read Jesus is speaking, uh, and in John 4 verse 13, he says this, talking to the, the, lady, the Samaritan lady he, he met at another well, in fact. <laughs> Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, i.e. normal water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And again, just over a few more pages in John chapter 7, Jesus speaking there in verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those believed in him will later to receive. So this, this, Jesus brings an interpretation for us as we read that passage today, that it's about you and I digging wells to discover the water of life that Jesus gives. This water of life that is so much more fundamental than water that physically you and I rely on. That's the point of, of, of what Jesus is saying in those New Testament passages. And so when we read a bit like this, it's not just a history lesson for you and me on pastoral farming in the 4,000 years ago. It's a, it's a spiritual lesson of how we need to be men and women who are learning to dig to discover Jesus and to discover the water of life that, that he wants to bring. There is a well we can dig that dig, leads to the water of life, that leads to the blessing of God, that leads to you and I having room and flourishing and ultimately encountering him. Other things that we pursue, other things that we may dig for, if you like, lead only to frustration, to disappointment, to disputes and quarreling. So there's three things quickly out of that. Uh, one, there is a well we can dig that leads to Jesus. Right? There is a thing we can pursue that leads to Jesus. What are the things that we pursue in life today that we dig for, that we spend our time in, that we devote ourselves to, that we make a priority in our lives Monday through just the following Sunday? You know, for a lot of people, it's things like money. It's things like acceptance. It's things like recognition. I want to be recognized. It's things like love. I want to be loved. It's things like even just surviving for some people. Those are the things that they pursue. And those things are important. But of themselves, they lead only to quarrels, to dissatisfaction, and to disputes. Ultimately, they do not satisfy on their own. It's only when we pursue Jesus that we encounter the blessing of God and his hand on us. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it's part, in part, it's because we were not made to make it on our own. We were made by God. We were made for God. And when we don't address that, when we ignore that and park it over there, when we pretend it doesn't exist, when we act as if that isn't true, then we spend our lives trying to fill that void, that gap, with other things that ultimately do not satisfy and that lead to that frustration and disappointment and unfulfilled longings. That is why Jesus said, He is the way. He is the truth. 
He is the life. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we can be saved. It is only through Jesus. And if we don't address that, we will live that constant sense of frustration and dissatisfaction. And and today, as we've already heard, is a bit of a wake-up call perhaps for someone to think, actually, yeah, I need to address this issue of Jesus. And I want to tell you, today is a great day to do that. Remembrance Day. What a great day to do that because you will remember it. So we were not made to deal with it on our own. Uh, and it's a, little, it's a little bit like uh, uh, one of these OS maps. We've bought one of these OS maps that you can choose where the middle is. And we sent up one on our house and got an OS map of all the walks around near where we live. Uh, and it's a little bit like h- holding that up. And you want to go from A to B. And actually, there's only one path that actually gets you all the way to B. Right? There's lots of other paths along the way. But they don't get you where you want to really end up. You know, the, you, get, you, you get into boggy land. You reach a road you can't cross. You get a river that you need to get over and you've got to do a massive detour. You know, all that type of stuff. If you've ever done any walking around here in the Peak District or whatever, you know what I mean. And it is just like there is one path. And that is the well that we need to be digging. That is the thing we need to be pursuing. It is Jesus. Second thing I want to say is, as Christians, we are called to persevere in our walk with God. It's so important that we get that. There are times when we think we are doing what God is asking. We think we're hearing God. We think we're digging the well. We think we're we're pursuing Jesus. We think we're we're responding to what he said to us. But somehow, things don't work out. Uh, The longer we go on following Jesus, the more we kind of realise that. I hope, <laughs> right? right. Sometimes things just do not work out as we thought they would do. But I thought God was saying this, and now it hasn't happened. I thought God was calling us to do this, and now it hasn't happened. Maybe it's even led to disputes and quarrels. I thought I heard God say, you know, that God is for me, so this must be right, what I'm doing. And things, things can start off looking like this is of God. Let's do this. Let's go for it. And we can convince ourselves that's the right thing to do for all sorts of reasons. But then, for whatever, it doesn't work out. Things come tumbling down. There may be arguments, disillusionment, disappointment, confusion. You know, and, and that, actually, I think that's probably true for all of us as we follow Jesus, right? Even down to just reading the Bible, right? God asks us to do that, but that can be hard work at times, can't it? And that can lead us to being confused. Even praying sometimes. You know, we think, I thought we're supposed to pray and, uh, and it's supposed to work, and I hear people talking about it working, but I find it difficult. Oh, you know, um, hearing God. People talk about hearing God. Well, I don't hear him very well. What, what, what does that mean? Am I deaf or, or, or what? Uh, and that can be frustrating. But then this church, isn't there? Right? <laughs> Where over the years, many of us, that even in this room, have been disappointed, have been frustrated, have been let down, have, been, have come to a place of disillusionment. And that can be a huge challenge. Uh, and a very difficult thing. You know, but yet, because the church is the place where God calls us to get on with other people, and yet that can be so hard at times. So what then? What do we do when we encounter those difficulties? What do we do, like in our story, when the guys dig the well and they quarrel and they can't stay there, what do they do? Do we, do we throw it all in? Do we say, this isn't really working, I'm going to stop? Do we, do, we, do we withdraw? Do we retreat? Do we stop digging? Well, I think the message from the story today, and I think what God wants to put on our hearts more and more, is no, but we press on. Maybe not straight away, but we dig again. We go again. We persevere again. Why? Because there is something much more beautiful, much more fundamental, much more glorious at work than just what is happening in your life and my life and how we are responding and reacting to that. In this passage, these guys were aware they were caught up in the purposes of God. 
that this wasn't just about them living their lives for three score and ten, and that's it. They were caught up in the purposes of God, and they got a hold of that. They knew that God was on the move. They knew that God was up to something. And they somehow, through no reason of their own, were caught up in that. And the amazing thing today in 2022 is that you and I are caught up in the same purposes of God as he is on the move today. And we need to let that stir us and give us a perspective about how we handle the disappointments and the frustrations and the annoying things that happen as we try and follow Jesus and get a hold of what he is actually doing. They recognized they were chosen. They were called. They were special. A chosen people. A people belonging to God. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. And that is what you and I have been called to be a part of as we follow Jesus together in this day and age. And oh, that needs to stir us and give a bit of perspective about the challenges that we face along the way. This was growing their faith. This was teaching them to trust God. This was teaching them to see his purposes worked out in the middle of stuff, of, of, of the mess of life and the complexity of life. And why has that happened, God? And why has that happened? And what, what's going on here? And this shouldn't have happened if we're following you, but it has. Oh dear. Right. This was teaching them to get over that. I think, no, actually, Jesus is calling us onward and forwards. It's back to that map analogy again. You know, the one path that we follow as we're out walking in the countryside, it does involve some big uphill climbs at times. It does involve walking through fog and driving rain, uh, like this morning, at time, and things we weren't wish we were doing. But it does involve that. And so we're called to be men and women who persevere. Finally, these guys, they came to dig the third well. And ultimately, this passage is about God's desire to bring his people to a place where they flourish, where they encounter him as his purposes are worked out in their lives. It's about God's heart and desire, not our own. This is about God calling us forward lifting up our eyes beyond the present circumstances, calling us into the plans and the purposes that he has for us, that he's drawing us onward, plans he has to do us good, to build us up, and to be a blessing. You know, that verse in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know the plans I have to you, to prosper you, to, uh, to not to harm you, to give you hope and a future, that's not a personal prophecy to every individual person in, in sat here this morning. That is a word to the church. That is a word to us corporately, that God's desire is to do that, because that is a word to the community out there, that through us, that is the heart of God, not to harm, but to prosper, to bring hope, and to bring a future and boy, there are people out there who need to hear that and grasp that and understand that Jesus is the one who is able to do that and bring that about. And that's what God is calling us to do. And that's what flourishing in the land, I think, means for us, that we carry his salt and his light into the world. And that is a journey that we are on together. God's desire is to bring you and I to a place where we have room in our lives, a place to live out what he is calling us to. It's like, just to, just to finish with that map analogy, you know, that after going through, after get, finding only the right path, after going through all the uphills, through all the fog and the rain, you reach the end result and there's this beautiful panoramic view that stretches out in front of you with the blue skies and, and, and the sunset, and you know that all the thing you went through on that walk was worth it for that view. And that is what God is calling us to. Calling us onward to that. I don't know what's going to happen about the nursery, right? But I do know that God's desire is to bring us to a place where we flourish in the land. A place where we encounter him and see the blessing of God affect other men, women and children. Where we see his kingdom grow where we see lives changed, hearts healed, people set free, the brokenhearted bound up, and the Lord's favour on people's lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.